Welcome to the 2021 President's Day Conference of the New York City Chapter of the American Guild of Organists, the annual principal event in our chapter's programming. My name is James Wetzel, and I am the sub-dean and the chairman of the program committee. I would like to thank our dean, James Kennerly, our webmaster, Sam Bartlett, who is serving as editor for these videos, and the rest of the program committee. This year's conference, being held virtually, is entitled French Music in America and comprises three sessions. Detailed performer and program information may be found in the video's descriptions. Later in the conference, Dr. Andrew Henderson, the chair of the organ department of the Manhattan School of Music, will offer a lecture recital, Performing French Classical Organ Repertoire Today, from the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, where he is the director of music. And later still, Christopher Houlihan, renowned performer, recording artist, and organist of Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, will offer a recital of French Romantic music, a specialty of his, from the mighty Aeolian Skinner of St. Bartholomew's Church on Park Avenue, where Paolo Bourdignon is the organist and host. In this first session of the day, we present a group of distinguished panelists who will discuss the influence of the French tradition on contemporary organ building, composition, and performance. James Kennerly will serve as moderator and will introduce the panelists. Which just leaves me to thank you for joining us and to encourage you to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube page for other content, including our ongoing Pipe Organs of NYC series. Welcome to the New York City chapter President's Day weekend. Um, we are joined here um, on our Zoom meeting with three wonderful people who represent three different factions and sometimes overlapping factions of the organ inspired world. We have Didier Cassin, who is the president of the Noack Organ Company. We have Stephen Tharp, who is the artist in residence at St. James Madison Avenue and organ solo concert artist extraordinaire and Rachel Laurent, who is also a, a practicing concert organist extraordinaire and of course, a great composer. So we brought all three of you together to talk about how the French tradition of organ music and, and composition has influenced your various careers. And so without further ado, uh, Didier, why don't we start with you? Um, I know that you, you grew up and worked in Europe and you worked for Manda organs. And I think when I was a child, I played two of your instruments at Chelmsford Cathedral um, and now, of course, you're president of an, of an American organ company. So maybe if you could start with your um, influences from that, the French tradition. Well, I mean, that's, I've got even a, a more French tradition than Mendes because actually I was I'm born in Poitiers and uh, you cannot be more lucky if you want to be <laughs> an organ builder than being born in Poitiers. So you are, I've been exposed to that uh, phenomenal organ in uh, the Clico, the François-Henri Clico organ from 1790, 1787, 1790, uh, in, in the cathedral. And you cannot go through experiencing that instrument without actually being moved viscerally uh, and, and understanding what an organ can be. So my, uh, my line usually is to my colleagues, if you've never been to Poitiers, you have no idea what an organ is. The, the way it speaks not only to your ears, but actually to your to your guts is actually, yeah, it's, it's a visceral experience. And when you go through that, you're a different man. And how can you not be an organ builder or try to be an organ builder? Uh, so that is, I think, my true roots. And I think it, uh, it permeates through all, everything I have done. Stephen, how about you? We, we associate your name, I know, with many um, uh, amazing instruments and recordings and composers, I think of Jeanne de Messieurs, Marcel Dupré, Saint-Sulpice. Is there a particular, a singular instrument or composer or perhaps both that, that sums up your French influence, um, influences that they've had through your career? Oh, that would be too hard to narrow down. Although <laughs> I tell you the earliest exposure to the organ through recordings uh, as a child, um, as I was making my list of famous instruments in the world and I would say to myself one day, I have this list, I'm gonna go and play all these famous organs. They were dominated from day one by French instruments. I don't know if it was accidental that uh, I had LPs from places like 
St. Thomas with Dupre, Saint Duan, Rouen with Dupre, Cochero LPs. Uh, before I had any Virgil Fox or E Power Biggs recordings, for example, that could have uh, uh, something to do with why the influence was so strong because it was the first real influence. Um, but no matter where in the world I might be playing, uh, the French repertoire, and will come to no surprise, as is the same for many people, dominates programs. Uh, there's just so much of it connected together with this incredibly long and rich tradition that you know sort of by default the majority of what you're going to come across in programming is uh, French music no matter where you're playing it and so the, the layers and layers of um, harmony and and uh, sound you know uh, talking about the organ like Poitiers I've played the organ of Poitiers and saint Maxima in Provence and uh, also uh, Bordeaux the Dombados and they really are just electrifying, life-changing uh, sounds, especially to experience live in a big stone acoustic for what that's doing to the sound of the instrument. Uh, and you can't help but be incredibly influenced to dig up even more. So uh, it's also no surprise that of the organs in Europe that I've uh, had the great fortune to record, the organs throughout France seems to sort of dominate the list. It's, that stuff's a largely by choice. Um, but, but, you know, the richness of this, that just, there's so much to continue to discover all the time. And with, uh, so much of this capped off at an early age, uh, by studying briefly with Jean Guillou in Paris, both his own music and improvisation when I was, uh, but 22 years old. And that's an eye opening thing too. And so many of those French instruments I experienced for the first time, uh, about that year, because I'd spent a good deal of the summer of 92 in France, uh, working with him as just a, sort of a side track, but traveling around to get my hands on as many organs as titulaires would let me come and play. And that just puts a tattoo on what you want to experience the rest of your life. It, it really just ingrains something that stays. That's pretty awesome. Rachel, yeah. in terms of your... Um, your uh, life and your composing and, and uniquely as a, as a composer and a performer, how, how has the French tradition influenced that part of your career? Well, my, my first contact with the French organ music, the symphonic romantic French organ music uh, was in Montreal. It's, it's funny to say, but uh, when I get at the conservatoire, when I entered the conservatoire in Montreal, I became pupil of Raymond Davilry, who was the titular organist. He was a composer and improviser and titular organist at St. Joseph's Oratory, the big sanctuary where they had installed in, in 1960 the gorgeous Rudolf von Beckerath organ, a five manual, 78 stops, uh, 5,000 pipes. And, and so this organ, you know that it, it's funny to say the indirect relationship with French organ building, but um, Rudolf von Beckerath, he was an apprentice and he worked and even he was director at the Victor Gonzalez uh, firm in France. And Gonzalez, as, uh, as you know, uh, was uh, he worked, he was an apprentice for, for Cavallicol. He was one of the last uh, to work for, for Cavallicol in the 1895, something like that. And so this organ at St. Joseph's Oratory, the Becquerat, is a mix, as, as Gonzalez, I, I think, aimed to do, is a mix of the symphonic organ, the, the, is a mix of the Cavallicol, the romantic sound, the big, you know, uh, these big plans, so, sonorous plans, and the French classical organ as Clicquot's organ and all these. Uh, so uh, my contact with St. Joseph Rotary organ was totally um, the central point of my, my teaching, my training as an organist and as a composer. That's where uh, I became acquainted to Louis Vian's music. I fell in love with this composer when I hear the sound of the symphonies of Vierne and Vidor as the second preferred one. And, um, and Raymond Davelry was a great performer of César Franck's music as well. And so uh, I was totally um, captivated by these sounds and the acoustics is, is eight seconds. So, so of course the acoustics are very important in the, the, uh, the quality of an organ. And so that's when I began to compose for the organ, I had the sound of the Beckerat in mind. And I had also this huge um, symphonic uh, mindset 
when I composed. Now, afterwards, of course, I heard uh, American organ builders, organs, you know, and I heard some German. Uh, and finally, when I compose nowadays, I think that my music reflects um, the organ as an independent instrument, as an orchestra, but with all these beautiful sounds from different organ builders, not only Cavaille Cole, but of course, uh, my first uh, um, crush for the organ came from this music and these organ builders. It's something, if I may uh, say something here, James, between the, the link between the three of us is it's not only the music which is written on, on the paper, on the score, it's very much experiencing the sound of the real uh, uh, organ in the flesh. Um, and it's something that uh, recordings have very great difficulty to capture, especially in those enormous acoustics. And, and it, it, it goes beyond that. And I think it makes a, a lot of sense to experience uh, the, the food before and the, the wine or the coffee and the whatever and the, and the good was cigarettes you may have afterwards whatever but it's it, it's it's a cultural bouillon culture it's a, it, it's a exactly it's a pot and it's it, it must be extremely hard for american uh, organists who's never had the chance to go to to to, to europe to really appreciate that and as much as they can be very beautiful recordings and you have a sense of it, but not quite. It's it's you eating, you eating the the canned vegetables. You don't eat the fresh vegetable, and and I think there is a dimension. If I can, if that uh, something can come out of that uh, little round table of, of the the four of us, is if we can encourage people to go to Europe, is really worth it. I mean, you, you, your discovery is going to be phenomenal. It's it's it's, it's a guarantee. Absolutely. And I think that it helps also uh, if we are talking about someone who is trained, who is in training uh, staff, students, uh, if they hear on the spot there, the organ, it also explains everything about the music they play. Uh, not only trying, but it, I think it's more important uh, for them to listen the organ from the nave first before trying out the, the manuals and the instrument. They need to get impregnated, uh, do you say that in English? Yeah, impregnated by, by the sounds, and then they understand uh, the symphony of Vidor, the, the symphony of, the, and they understand the, the, uh, this suite from Durifle, they are playing all the time on different instruments. But I would say that um, I, I always hope as a composer uh, and for every other composers that the music can be adapted to every instrument. I'm looking for an eclectic instrument also, but that's true that this symphonic French sound is, is very, um, very powerful. Absolutely. I, I always found that uh, the thing that surprised me most about how thinking about this music changed after experiencing these instruments uh, live for the first time was uh, not just Tempe and what acoustics versus dry rooms do to uh, how it feels, how you listen, but what you understand different about temperament, which is not just the same as uh, Tempe. It's uh, the, the analogy I use when I teach is uh, how you bend the ebb and flow of something that you shape determines the temperament of the music. And it's like a sweater because the sweater is woven and the sweater has spaces and the more you pull the sweater without breaking the fabric, the more open that is to breathe. So there are different ways to let those things mold, stretch and shape, but it still stays intact, I guess, architecturally as one whole. And it's, it's the difference between an organ uh, that's built a certain way in a drier space. And as soon as you play something, the attack is like this. And the first thing you notice about a, even a big tutti of a kavai call is this whoom that comes. There's the sense of the breath, the air, the time it takes to produce a sound in a certain way that you can physically feel on a coupled Barker machine. Um, and that changes completely what you know is possible in the music and also not possible. Uh, and what therefore these people really meant when they composed a certain 
piece a certain kind of way because this is what they had in mind. This is what allowed possibilities. This is what prevented it from being different music and adapting to a different kind of American organ or a drier space is having that idea in your mind so that you can shape something that you can't really see. I mean, it's a little like bringing French music to a dry American space, but it's a hologram. You know, it's, it's like you were saying, it's a picture of this fantastic steak, but you can't smell it. You know, you can't see it sizzle. You can't, it's, it's, it, there isn't that three dimensional aspect of the experience. And playing all of this music, and this is not only true in France, I found this throughout, you're playing a Zilbermann, playing a Schnitger, playing St. Bavo Harlem. Um, but so much of this rich music from France dominates our repertoire that this is where I had the first influence of how my thinking would change. And I was surprised how much I understood aesthetics and, and molding pieces in a completely foreign setting, uh, a different way by having experienced firsthand these organs, uh, hearing them, but also playing it. If I may ask, in a very practical way, when you play this French music, so you understand it, you, you, you have the smell still in your nose, you know, you know what it smells still, and you're in a completely different organ, in a completely different acoustics. How in practical terms do you handle that? By trying to, well, for me, uh, remember what those experiences are and therefore uh, how you make the uh, adaptation. Uh, and then of course, what extremes you have to go through to make the adaptation, depending on how different where you are at that moment might be. And those extremes can be enormous sometimes. Um, it's, it's like repeating, I guess, a certain role in Shakespeare, for example. 35 or 40 years after you studied it with a real master who always reminded you to think about how you felt about what you were saying and what vocabulary with time and experience that lets you retain and build upon so that as you adapt there's a kind of virtuosity and vocabulary in the adaptation skills themselves and the more you get to renew that by revisiting these places in Europe the fresher and then more complex that becomes when you want to adapt it. I think also that you need to uh, to know how to mix the stops. Uh, you have some recipes in order to imitate a little bit. For example, if you want to, to have the, the trumpet from Frank on the swell, when he has this so beautiful trumpet solo in the, the third choral, uh, I, I heard some organists in, at St. Joseph's Oratory on the background who were, there were, there were no trumpets on the swell, but we were able with the oboe um, to do a kind of, and, and the mix with the presto for, with some uh, foundations to do the, the round trumpet of the swell of Frank. And I, I knew some organists, they were just pulling the trumpet on the grate uh, to do this expressive and the great was not expressive, need, needless to say. So I think you, you need to, to develop an ability and to listen a lot and develop an ability to, to do some cooking, some uh, recipes where you can mix this sound and this sound. And I experiment that when I play some Skinner, Skinner's organ in the United States. You can play French music on these organs. They have beautiful foundations, generous warm foundations and you can beautiful uh, solo stops. So I think that you can adapt perfectly well. Um, I played recently at Wolsey Hall at uh, Yale University and this beautiful organ is, is an orchestra. So I think that you can really reproduce without imitating perfectly. It's not a question of imitating, but you can reproduce the music and the phrase and the breathing and the sound that uh, these composers uh, requested, I think so. Absolutely, and when you have organs like this, you're not necessarily changing what colors you would have had in the original registrations, but you're keeping that character in mind, even if the sounds are not always exactly. Exact. The personality of the music stays the same, and um, you're just sort of amplifying the idea, which works really well, because it says, Was Celeste, I know I see, if that's what you have in a Cavalli Cole organ and there's one set of strings, fine. If you have Wolsey Hall, you have an entire orchestral division, <laughs> which you can use to do the same kinds of things. Um, yeah. I was very, very lucky 21 years ago already now to uh, be the first person to play Messiaen Livre du Saint Sacrement at Wolsey. And a lot of what was in the score was that this is not what's going to happen here because you can amplify so many things and every one of your options on an organ like that are so beautiful. 
that it's convincing and yet uh, the idea of what the original core of the piece was about stayed intact anyway. Absolutely. Didier, Didier I, I wonder when... Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, I, I was to ask a question to Didier about wh when he builds organ, if he goes uh, towards uh, French symphonic sounds, or what are you looking for uh, principally? But but you can go, James, if you have uh, another question. I was actually going to ask exactly the same thing, uh, especially when Didier, when you're designing, you know, are you thinking of a particular repertoire that's going to be played? Are you thinking that people might take certain stops and combine them to recreate a, you know, a, a, the cave called trompette or, or what? Where, where no, do you I come from? I, no, I don't think it, it, it works actually that way. Um, there, is, there is indeed a, a foundation because you cannot escape your roots. So I cannot pretend to be German. I'll, it'll never work. I'll, it's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So, so you need to, to, to go with that flow. Uh, but with this in, in the same token, I had the chance, and it's probably a little bit uh, unique in the trade is I've worked in many countries and, and in uh, being involved in actually very uh, great projects. Uh, and I learned so many different things with those different people. And sometimes they'd not combine happily and sometimes they combine. Uh, and I had to, that was a complicated uh, decision because when I took over Noack, I was not going to be Fritz Noack. I had to reinvent something. Uh, and this, it doesn't work. You cannot say I'm going to make French organs because the, the, the environment is not there. The acoustics is not there. The and people want to do more than just French organ music, which is perfectly logical. So it becomes, especially in places of worship, that the, the liturgy and the music ministry that they're running is driving that process of what is the sun is going to be. And from there, we're just going to, to, to tilt if you want the whole tonal architecture in one direction or the other, but still maintaining coherence. I think the greatest uh, asset of an organ is its coherence. Uh, and I made a lot, uh, often the comparison of the organist is a chef in the kitchen. I am the provider of the spices. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the, as a chef, you have to tell me what you want to cook. And if you're going to say, you know, I'm going to cook Chinese and Indian and Mexican and French. And, and I think you need this an enormous pantry that well, you, you cannot have. You make some, some choices and we can go, some fusion cooking is possible. You can mix up Mediterranean and, and Asian and it's okay. But you're not going to be able to, to mix up Mexican and Indian. That doesn't go together. So we have to have, to have that sort of discussion about what is the cuisine you want to go for. And then we're going to talk about how we're going to shape things. And that starts really with the first stop, which is uh, Le Montre, the, the, the principle. That is, is, is a, is the reason why it's called the principle because that's everything is based on it. And the quality of that principle is going to define the whole tonal architecture. After that, you can always add colors. The Vox Humana or Ranket or something is, doesn't belong to it. It's just an extra spice. But the foundation that you're going to, 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 to put together all the way to the construction of the plenum has to be extremely coherent. So are we going to have a uh, Willis open one and open two, or you're going to have a mold? And the quality of the sun is going to be very different. Uh, the instruments that we just finished uh, in, in uh, St. Peter's on Capitol Hill in DC, uh, the principle of the mold is actually, if you go down in the base, it's actually quite fluid and it has a body, but it's not dense. Well, if you would have a big Lutheran uh, principle, you would get that because you need that to push and to hold the congregation singing. You're in a Catholic church, which are not well known for singing a lot, then you have a different quality of sand. And the sand is going to be warm, it's going to embrace you but it's not going to push you. So it's not actually quite, is it French or is that not French? Do you think more about a concert organ or a liturgical organ, or it depends on what you are requested it, it, to do? It, 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 it very much uh, depends. It's very interesting because there has been more and more requests now from Catholic churches in, in, in the US, which in 20 years ago, they probably would have purchase an electronic instrument. And now exactly. they, do, they yeah. go for a pipe organ and a tracker. I mean, they go really all the way back to yeah. the, uh, you know, the niche of, of, of organ building, if you want. 
Uh, so it's very interesting. And they, they want to have plain chant accompaniment. They want to be improvisation. They want to, to, to have this repertoire of Tournemire and, and all this rich 19th, 20th century uh, Catholic repertoire. And they want to be able to, to, to do that. So they are not that much interesting indeed in the Luther way of hymned singing or the Dutch way. What I like in, in Vian's music, uh, James, what I like in, in Vian's scores, if you open the score, uh, you know exactly how to adapt his music to every organ because Vian's uh, conception of the registrations, he, he wrote his registrations for three manual standard organ and it was quite um, uh, eclectic as registrations. It, it's very easy, but when you take the scores of Vidor symphonies, uh, you're at Saint Sulpice. You, it's really difficult to to adapt, and you can't follow the registrations he, he put in the score. So I think um, when I compose, I always follow uh, the the example of Vian's symphonies and and pièces de fantaisie to to write my own registrations and my scores. But it doesn't limit the use of this music to only French organ, of course. Mm -hmm. Do you find then, Russia, when, when you compose, I'm thinking of, 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 of the Atlantic composition, the Mr. Mistopheles Overture, which was just a fabulous kaleidoscope of color. It seemed like it was written for that exact organ, but, but when I performed it, I, I seem to remember the score is very, as you say, it's very clear, uh, certainly not generic, but, but it, it's, it's very open to interpretation in terms of the colors. And, and so you do that really on purpose to help I, I hope that my music will be performed on every organ, you know. Uh, when, for example, when I composed the Etude Week uh, in 2003, 2004, it was for a competition in Quebec City. And this organ was a four manual uh, neoclassical uh, Casava organ, but uh, with multiple colors, you know. And so I, I used a little bit of ideas to show this specific instrument, but in, in mind, uh, I, I hope that this music was going to be performed on a three manual, on a two manual, on a symphonic, on a, and then I heard this etude heroic uh, performed on a German uh, tracker organ. Um, I, I'm not sure there were some pistons, and I thought, oh my God, how is it going to sound? I was scared to death, and then it was fabulous. I rediscovered my my etude heroic. It was new colors, but totally adaptable. And then uh, I was very happy because when I composed afterwards, I thought, okay, I don't have any fear uh, if I use registration standards, but if my music suggests um, uh, contrasting colors, I, I win, it's a win-win. So uh, I'm not scared anymore about where my music is going to be performed. <laughs> Now, Stephen, I'd love to talk to you about Jeanne de Messier. We celebrated her birthday this weekend. Um, and I think, and, and, you know, to, to all of us watching this and to most people in the world, you are one of the, if not the champion of her music. And one of the few people who can actually play all of those etudes, speaking of etudes <laughs> from Rachel. How, how has her music uh, and her relationship with Dupé and with, with, with French instruments, of course, how has that influenced your career? And how, how did you get into de Messier in the first place? I always thought that her music, like uh, for many composers, was uh, undeservedly neglected and overshadowed by people like Dupre. You wonder if initially that had as much of a, a political reason as it did a musical one, given the rift between she and her teacher uh, and what that did to her career in certain countries uh, and whatnot. Uh, of course, a lot of it is excruciatingly difficult to play. <laughs> That's um, a good not, reason. <laughs> not everybody wants to, to bring it out for every concert tour that they do. Um, when I was looking for a composer to record uh, all of their music back in uh, was 2007, 2008, I wanted to do something that you didn't see very much or didn't really exist uh, in any sort of commercial way now. I know that Pierre Labrique had done recordings of uh, what of her music had been published uh, after, after having worked with her. Um, but I, I sat down with Aeolus uh, recordings uh, and the fabulous engineer Christoph Froman uh, about doing something for his label that really was a little bit rare. And I had played the chorales and the Te Deum, of course, and uh, the response for the time of Easter and a lot of the pieces that people who play Demisieux perform. Uh, but I thought, wouldn't it be fun to just put 
all of this down on some very interesting organs. And I think that was the reason I chose her uh, to do a complete work sort of cycle. It, it's most definitely music that technically pushes all your boundaries, but it's it's been very engaging um, for me to discover her music in a deeper level by having lived with it more. I think people think of her as, um, it's kind of heady in some ways, it's warmed over Dupre in other ways, and that really is not fair. Um, she is a language of her own that has, like all these things we're talking about today, roots in one thing that blossoms in her own individual way into something else. Um, and so uh, I've really, really, uh, found it rewarding to dig as deep as possible with this music and play it as often as I can. And so um, in 2010 was an anniversary uh, year for her and uh, well, 2010, 2011 actually um, would have been the anniversary of her birth. But I had the opportunity to play all of her music in three concerts at St. John the Divine here in New York. And later this year in November, I'm going to do the same again uh, three Saturdays in a row at St. Thomas on the New Dobson um, as a sort of tail end to Jeremy Filzel's cycle of all the Dupre works, which has already begun. And so I'm very excited about that. And uh, having had the, the chance to, to make myself learn all of those silly etudes, I may get through this year at St. Thomas and say I'm never playing them again. Um, but but uh, there's so much more there than meets the eye as far as what many organists understand about her music just because they don't play it and there haven't been many, many recordings. Um, I guess it's true that she had signed a contract to record all of her etudes, but then died uh, and it was never fulfilled. I know there is at least one of her etudes, the Tiers, uh, available on one of the volumes of her playing uh, various European organs. But because that example didn't exist and was so overshadowed by all of the Franck, all of the Duraflé, all of the Dupre, the Vierne cycles, the Vidor cycles. Uh, she just kind of got sidestepped. And I thought, well, let's put something out there that gives people a chance to really experience this music uh, more. Yeah. Also, I think, Stephen, that you are the virtuoso to play that music because uh, to play Jean de Monsieur's studies and, and the six of these, uh, you need not only to be a virtuoso, but you need to, to be a musician over that. And so you need to have no technical problems to play that music so that the music can go first when you play it. If you are nervous and scared when you play that music, the music won't pass. It will, it will sound dry and uh, very uh, cerebral, as you said. But I think that you need really to, to have a virtuosity that is so extremely high level. So that's why her music is a little bit neglected. I think that you need to be at a very high level. Fortunately, she wrote these uh, these verses, you know, on Gregorian chant. And mm -hmm. um, what is very sad in that, that story is that she, I think she died before she totally uh, found her, um, her unique voice. She found it in the studies. She found her voice. You feel that in the Easter uh, the Easter improvisation uh, on Tidy Woman, you feel that, but you feel also that she had more to say and she, she didn't have time. That's a tragedy, I think. That's very, very true. And you see that springing to life just in a very small way in the, I mean, the, the response for the time of Easter, of, of course, was the one that was published, but then there were four others that were never published in her lifetime that uh, are published now, I think, but Delatour. And uh, when Christoph Froman and I decided to do this project, he went to Pierre Labrique and asked yeah. if there was anything in manuscript at that time that we could obtain and include. And so by the time I made the recording, um, I think the publication of those responses was in the works, but they were not in print. I played from a manuscript, be it, be it his rewriting of hers, or this was a photocopy of her actual writing, I'm not sure. Um, but you can see in there um, a little bit of influence of Messiaen, you see in, in the choice of colors, you see in her pushing the chromaticism away from Dupre the way she had done, but continuing in that direction even more. Mm -hmm. And had she lived longer and developed more of that, you would have seen something, uh, as you say, completely uh, stretched beyond all of her other music in, in a way that, you, as you say, she didn't have time to find. So congratulations, in a way, the studies are, uh, it's really a challenge, but uh, I'm sure you, in French, we say you play that, the, your finger in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> 
about it was fun working a little, as I had mentioned, with Zhang Guiyu, who I thought this person must have the best pedal, pedal technique in the world. Um, the quietude with which uh, the subtleness of, of a movement. And uh, to this day, I, I try to keep striving in those directions as a, as a approach to pedal technique. And it applies in no greater way than with these etudes um, about keeping yourself limber and relaxed. And I, I think if you can play the pedal parts of all six of the etudes, you really can kind of play anything. <laughs> like they say, if you yeah. play all three of sonatas, you can repertoire if you want something that makes your technique uh as subtle as possible uh, for pedaling get out some of those etudes especially tears it is it's just unrelenting and uh, once you master it you really feel like you've got a hold of something it's a nice thing <laughs> is it is it something you have to play by memory because in order to do you play that in by memory in concerts because you have to look what you do and jumps and everything I did not the last time, and uh, that's because when I played these at St. John the Divine, it was the first time I did all six. Um, but I have some other concerts I, I hope that will be rescheduled uh, later this year and into next year where uh, all six are on the program. It's not just for the St. Thomas cycle um, in Germany, uh, largely. And maybe one thing in London, if, if it can be rescheduled. Um, and my plan then is to have them all memorized because I, I, it's a set of pieces that you just have to know that well. Yeah. Yeah. like a piano playing Ligeti or all the Chopin or, or whatever. Um, I, and I feel now during this lockdown, this is the opportunity to have the time in advance to, to try to find a way to do it. Didier, I'd love to talk a little bit about what I've often seen as French fever, that there were lots of organists in the 1950s and 60s who went um, from the US to study with people like Jean Anglais and even as early as Dupré. And and I, I, from what I've understood, they would bring back those ideas, at least the visceral sense of what a French organ was. Um, and then when they had the chance to commission instruments in their, ch their own churches, you know, they, they, would, they would go for trompette over a trumpet and a bombard over a, a trombone. Um, is that, how do we contextualize that? And how has that legacy lasted? Because, of course, your instruments, I'm some French sure. names. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and, and you bring up first the question of the, the, the names, the names of the stops. And this is really something I'm, I'm struggling a, a lot uh, these days, because what do you do? If you put a, a, a French name on it, then people are expecting to have a French sound. But actually, this, as we talked earlier, the surrounding is not there. The, not everything is there. So, so you, you, you're getting half of the deal. So it's, people feel disappointed. But by the same token, some people say, yes, but when I pull a stop, I would like to see on the label what I am likely to expect. And that's going to be very, very difficult because how do you plan for people's expectations? It's very tough. Mm -hmm. So, so far, I've stick to the idea of having a sort of uh, non-generic, sort of generic language. And if I could, I would, uh, if, 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 if the clients will allow me I would use Latin words that nobody has ever used and <laughs> and therefore there is no reference to anything so instead of reading the label and and as as Rachel was saying you know pulling the trumpet because it says it should be a trumpet there instead of listening to what it is I think would be really great I think I think that there is some organs you you just have eight four two you don't know what it is is that a principle I mean try it Taste it. Do you like it? Do you don't like it? Maybe you want to make it differently. I think it will be so much better. So I think the names on the label is is always a tough one, and that's that, that's difficult. I, I think uh, the the French organs may have also received bad press in, in America for people who've never been to Europe and what they experience. Maybe this very brush and and uh, petardon, just this explosion of of reeds <laughs> in their in their tiny little congregational church is, is really unpleasant. And, and if you go to France, you never had that sense of pokiness. The reeds are not pokey, they are rich, they are powerful. There is a sort of, it, they hold you, but then they, they're never pokey. Um, and, and becomes therefore a, a caricature of the sand as the sort of pokiness. And, and, and I think it, it misled people. So I'm hoping that we are a little bit more discerning now in a, if we want to bring some, some French sounds. And again, that's why so far I've kept sort of generic English names. And I've been given bad time for that, I have to say. Hmm. Rachel, is, is there a particular, um, <clears throat> we, we talked about St. Joseph's oratory, and, and I guess, you know, Mohel has, has so many fantastic 
European or instruments that match, you know, the buildings that are similar to size to Paris, the instruments are similar size. Is there a particular instrument in, in France that you sort of identify with as a performer and maybe as a composer, improviser? Um, no, <laughs> I, I can't. I can't identify one instrument. I, I can say that the, the Abbasial of Saint Ouen in, in Rouen, Normandy, is a is a kind of revelation. It's it's very a very important instrument, particularly because the color of Cavaillacol is is still there. You know, even we have a, a huge uh, respect for Notre Dame de Paris um, organ, but this instrument was so much modified over the years. Uh, you had Cosrolo changing and, and the mixtures are not at all th what they were before. I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying that uh, we can't, it's very impressive, in impressing when you hear the organ from the nave. And I think I prefer to listen to the instruments than trying these myself because you have really the feeling of the sound uh, more when you are in, in the nave than when you are at the console. Uh, for these huge cathedrals and th these huge uh, um, venues. Uh, so I can't really name one instrument. I'm very impressed, of course, by St. Sulpice's uh, also organ. But uh, frankly, it's very difficult. There are a lot, a lot of gorgeous instruments, and not only in France. Um, so I, I'm not a collectioner of, of organ consoles. I'm more a listener and an enjoy how you say in English someone who enjoys the sound and the organ as, as a whole and um, as um, how you say in English a uh, um, consistent um, approach to the the organ uh, conception so um, I think that I'm an organ lover simply it seems to be that when I, I, I listen to you Rachel it seems to be that spend more time at the cafe and less less time at the console and, and you'll understand the organ better. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And it's, I, I think it, uh, as, as much as Notre Dame or Saint-Sulpice has this sort of world aura about how those, those wonderful organs, they are very odd organs. I mean, Saint-Sulpice is the, the oddest organ ever. I mean, it's, it's this enormous machine, which is so mild uh, compared with this number of stops. You, you, well, Notre Dame is actually, everything is a power, it's a wall of sand going in. This actually are not really the true French organs. Uh, saint Ouen is so dark and, and, and dramatic, it's absolutely phenomenal. But you, you should go to the province and go a little town like Elbeuf in, in Normandy. In Elbeuf, there's three churches and they have uh, a, a caviacol from 1850, one from 1870 and one from 1890. So you have the three caviacols in the one little city of you know, 10,000 inhabitants. And those are the real spies, the real, uh, Boeuf Bourguignon of the <laughs> of the French uh, French organ building of the 19th century. Uh, so, if you really, I mean, I would be interesting to have Stephen's uh, intake on that. Uh, if um, if you want to have really a sense of what a French organ, don't go to those big names. Go to the little things. Go to the smaller ones where he was maybe first of all experimenting more. You know what what was the the more romantic cavaillacol and where had that come from and how does that change when it's the the symphonic cavaillacol, um, and these organs like like that also uh, sometimes they don't seem that they were as easily restored or as messed with and so their original uh, character it still stands even with its imperfections uh, as as a, a real blanket statement of of uh, what he was doing at that time that still sounds like it's supposed to, you know, it, it, all these restorations are great to keep these big organs going, but do they in fact, you know, change sounds? Uh, Toulouse had been uh, cleaned many times, uh, uh, for example. So, so that I think that that's a very true statement. What you're what you're getting at. And did you, in terms of your your lineage, obviously, as you've mentioned before, you are the most unique, I think, among organ builders, and that you have the French tradition, the English tradition, the American tradition, the Canadian traditions um and, and and is is there a particular thread that you've that you've carried with i mean we've talked about a certain amount of this um but in terms of is there some buff bourguignon in in all of your organs or is it a little fish pie? i don't know i'm not the one who's going to be do, judging you are going to be the one to, going to tell me that i don't know anymore uh you you lose a little bit of of yourself but actually the the wealth of experience you're gaining it's so wonderful uh, 
uh, it's it, it, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky to have been able to to do all that. But again, the roots remain the same. So, uh, just to give you an example, uh, in recent organs, uh, I've uh, partnered with Bertrand Catiou, who is uh, one of the top uh, voices in France. Um, Bertrand now has has left his own firm, but he he would like to carry on because he is passionate, and he does many voicings. So. We, I invited him to, to, to work now. We are going to do our third instrument with him. His participation is, is, it varies according to the instrument. And he told me he was, he was very comfortable to, to work with me because we've been fed the same milk. That's what he said. <laughs> and indeed, there was a sort of understanding, uh, underlying understanding about what is an organ is, and, and we understand each other. And sometimes it, those, those elements are difficult to actually put into words. You just grew in, in, into that. Like you grew into a musical tradition, uh, I'm assuming. And it's, uh, it's difficult to get out of it. I'm not sure even if you can. I remember uh, Dominic Gwynn, I remember interviewing Dominic Gwynn, who was a, a top organ builder in England, very traditional, uh, beautiful work, beautiful craftsmanship. And uh, I was, he, uh, putting a little article about a little portrait of him for, for a, a journal. And he said something along the line of, you know, you only build the organs you've been taught to build. And as a 20 year old budding organ builder, I, I found that crushing. That means that's it, I'm done. I mean, I've been given that, there's nothing I can do. It, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. But in the same token, there was a lot of truth in that. And, uh, and, and one needs to embrace it, and, and you can depart from it exactly like you were de describing Jean de Monsieur's uh, work, who picked up a bit of this. There was, there was some Messiaen, you can, you can peel, pick up some Dupre, you can pick up some, some Vierne in there, but step by step, she is able to provide her own language. So I'm hoping to get just that, but I don't know if I'm going anywhere. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I would love to hear, Didier, about those those instruments. We talked about St. Peter's on Capitol Hill in Washington, and I know you have an instrument in, in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and, and these are sizable three manual instruments, um, at least one, well, both of them in Roman Catholic churches, as you said, which is sort of going against the trend of what's happened in the last 50 years. Um, where do you see as a, the, the broadest possible question? Where do you see organ building going in the next 25, 50 years in this country? Um, and how do you see the continuing or maybe departing influence from that French tradition from the early middle of the century? Well, that is a tough one. I don't even know how to answer <laughs> that question. My crystal ball is really broken there. Uh, the only thing we can, I'm not sure we can, we can answer that question. We can at least look back and see how it evolved uh, in the past. There is one thing, um, thinking, and, and because of my background, which is very rooted in Europe and, and been projected in, in America, which is a sort of, indeed, a land of extraordinary opportunities. Um, you, you look at, at how organ building is done in the two continents. And there is some, I think, some fundamental choices which, which are different. You can, I think the, the American organ building, and I'm talking about this, the, the Skinner, which becomes Alien Skinner, and all those Austins and Moners and all those people were extremely uh, prolific in, in, in terms of organs. They are based ultimately from the sort of Hope Jones, Victorian's line of, of the English organ building. And you have another branch of organ building, and those are much more recent. Those are the uh, Tello and Boudis and the Paul Fritz and Martin Pazis and Richard Fox, which are more German. That's a German and more European. And I, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm probably closer to them because we are European. And what it is about, I think Nathan Lauber uh, uh, put it quite nicely uh, in, in a recent Eroy uh, conference. Uh, he, he was talking about how this um, Hooks and Hastings, they had their how you were playing them and how you were playing those stops one versus the other. And it was completely different than the way you would use a European organ. A European organ being German or Dutch or French is extremely, it's a hierarchy of planes, of, of tonal planes. You have the cantor, you have the positive is, is, is in front of it, the receiver is behind. There is a very strict hierarchy and each division 
has a very specific role. The positive is just there to give you crispness and presence and, and precision and subtleties. The Godong is going to give you breath. The swell behind is going to give you the sort of uh, 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 wave of coming in and out. You talk about an American organ. I'm getting a bit a little lost sometimes because there is not that kind of hierarchy of what those plants I can be. I, I even saw uh, an organ. There was three manual divisions side by side, only enclosed, and they were called great choir and swell, but actually they could have been reversed nearly. <laughs> the, there was no actually uh, uh, usage of the location, of the placement of, of the of the division, which I think is a great shame because I think it, it helps. Now, it would be very interesting to have Rachel and Stevens take on that about how do they play with that? Does it matter? Because it seems to be that you cannot play French organ without that hierarchy. So when you are in, a, in an alien skinner or a skinner organ, you don't mm. have that hierarchy, that placement of, of, of divisions. When you look at an orchestra, there's a very strict precision what, where the first violin is, the oboes and the flutes and, and the brass at the back and the shadows there. When you a choir director, you place your choir in a very specific way. You may even change it for different pieces to achieve very specific things. The organ uh, builder's role, I think, and we don't talk much about that. We talk about the scales and the voicing technique, but the placement, where you're going to place your pipes is going to have a phenomenal influence about how that pipe is going to speak. This is what I'm, to, now to come back to your question, maybe, maybe perhaps there is more emphasis about where we place those pipes in order to achieve something very specific. Instead of to have this ethereal sound, which can be very impressive, but has no directivity. But let's let the, the musician now take from that and. and, and well, say. I, I just have a few words to say, and after Stephen, I'll let, I'll let you talk uh, all the time you want. I just, I, I just want to say that um, even Casavant, uh, did did you work with Casavant organs, uh, Didier? Yes, I, Okay, okay, I was not sure because even some Casava organs from the 1930s or 90s, they, they had a choir instead of a positive. Uh, Saint Jean Baptiste in Montreal is a, an example of that. It's a great four manuals, but you have a solo uh, manual on the fourth manual. And then you are okay, the great, the swell are quite uh, standard, but uh, for symphonic music, but the choir is a problem. Uh, so often when we play some Franks music, some viands, even viands, we have to solve a lot of problems because of that. Uh, and the position of the manuals is not too much a problem that the great is, is the second manual or the first, that's not a problem, it's the sound. And as you say, uh, the hierarchy of the sound, uh, manual by manual, section by section. So we, we have to solve problems. And so uh, as organists, as performers, I, I think we have to solve more problems than uh, to enjoy <laughs> sometimes. We have, a, we have a diversity of those problems that other instrumentalists don't necessarily have. Um, uh, the obvious answer is sometimes you get situations where certain kinds of music on that particular XYZ organ are just not going to work play something else. You don't go to an organ in 1964 that has no enclosed divisions and say, this is gonna be great for Franck. I mean, just just don't make yourself that problem. Um, <laughs> but you look at a, a Skinner organ, for example, where the choir division on the first manual, let's say, um, is small color stops, small accompanimental stops, some small color reads, but where does that fit into uh, three manual divisions of a French uh, setup? So you start with coupling a full swell to your great, and just the foundations. And as you build those stops, your positive reads become your great and something with a box closed halfway, like a solo tuba becomes your grand org reads and you're not even using choir division. Mm -hmm. um, and then what's the acoustic or not of, of, of this? It's some, an organ which everything is placed just the way it should, but the sound isn't working or a Skinner that's off to the side in the chancel where you don't get the physical presence of the hierarchy, but you still get the layers in the color. So you adapt it as close as possible, even if none of the reeds sound like a French organ at all, but you're imitating um, a caramel cake with some chocolate as best you can. At least you still say it's a cake and not a cupcake. So um, it, it's those kinds of problems. I think of the Almut Russell recordings in Germany uh, of Messian's music uh, and which he supervised, I guess, which was a, a Becquerat at her church where, okay, this color is not available, use a regal. I don't have a flute, use this. Um, yeah. Change mutations in some cases. How far are you willing to go 
to make the adaptations without it changing everything you intend so much that maybe it, it isn't worth it and you should play something else. Sometimes you get uh, the situation where that is so insurmountable that you can't solve it. But I would say that at the end of the day, what is important is the poetry of the sound of an organ. So I'm sure if you play a, a Noak organ or a Skinner organ, or you will find, oh, why did he do that like this? Why the sound and on the other instrument as well. And at the end of the day, when you play the concert, you feel happy because there is some poetry in the voicing, particularly the voicing of the stops. And, and that's, uh, the, that's the whole wonderful thing about the organ having yeah. as its point of, of importance, its cohesion, because an organ that is not say the same style as this repertoire that tries to be one thing tends to be more convincing in everything than an organ that tries to be a little of everything. And it's so schizophrenic, you don't really know what you've got. The first time I heard Mission was on the Clicquot in Poitiers. It was huh. mesmerizing, absolutely uh -huh. mesmerizing because all the colors were there. They were, they, but it was an 18th century instrument. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, I must say, Stephen, Didier, Hachel, I think our time is up, but thank you all so much for joining us. What a fascinating uh, melting pot of the conversation and melting pot of instruments and cultures and music. Thank you all so much. Thank well, you so much. Thank you.